I am joined by Ed Conard, who worked uh, alongside U.S. presidential candidate, former presidential candidate Mitt Romney at Bain Capital. Uh, you're also author of Unintended Consequences, Why Everything You've Been Told About the Economy is Wrong. Uh, and here also we've got Nell Abernathy. You worked recently uh, on a paper, on a report on inequality with Nobel laureate economist Joseph Stiglitz. You're also a fellow at Roosevelt Institute. Now, if I could start with you, is income inequality a problem? Thanks so much. Yes, absolutely. And for two reasons. One that we hear about much more often is the fairness issue, which I'll talk about. And then second is it's actually an economic problem as well. As for the fairness, you mentioned in your opening the American dream. Well, we know now that most Americans don't believe that if they work hard and play by the rules, they can get ahead. In a recent poll, only 35% believe that. And in fact, nine out of 10 Americans are more concerned with economic security than mobility. That means they're just trying to get by. They're not thinking about getting ahead. So that speaks to the fairness issue, I think. Many, many people believe that the rules are stacked against them. Then in terms of the economic issue, we've recently learned that um, really, economic inequality has the potential to hurt growth. Now, a, a lot there. Ed, do you agree? Uh, no, I don't agree. The U.S. has uh, some of the highest inequality in the world, and it grew faster than Europe and Japan before the uh, recession, and it has recovered faster since. So I think it's hard to make the case that income inequality slows growth. As well, I think what matters is what it is that causes income inequality in the United States and what, it effect, what effect that has on the rest of the population. There's really two economies. One is a, an economy that scales with the world. As the world grows larger relative to individuals, Taylor Swift is going to make more money. And so are innovators and financiers and anybody who can access and scale with the world economy. But most people scale on an individual basis. They're doctors or teachers or waitresses, and they can only serve so many customers. And so their growth scales on a personal basis as opposed to with the world economy. And so over time, we are going to see that the 1% in the United States who's been far more successful at accessing the world than everyone else is going to grow faster. Does that take money away from the middle class? No, it increases the demand for middle class employment and, and working class employment. The U.S. has had twice as much uh, employment growth since 1980 as Europe three times more than Japan. But if you look at demographics there's also uh, I increasingly a pattern you see emerging where the affluent stay affluent. So if you're uh, lucky enough to come from a good family, go to a good school, end up at a good college, chances are you'll stay richer throughout your life. If you grow up in a poor neighborhood the chances of moving upward uh, are harder and harder and surely that is the cornerstone of a lot of the American dream, this idea of upward mobility. A definitive study was done by Sayez and Chetty on mobility which came out a couple of years ago and it found no change in the relative mobility of Americans uh, and it found an increase in the absolute mobility of Americans. So the probability that anybody can earn say $100,000 a year has gone up over time but the relative changes haven't been much different. No, we've had a lot recently from the IMF. They've drawn a link, the International Monetary Fund, they've drawn a link between economic instability and income inequality. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, on that, whether you shared their view. There seems to be assumption that any kind of intervention is going to inherently stop growth. But in fact, what we see in the IMF is that it's possible to have growth and redistribution, and that those actually aren't in conflict all the time, depending on the kinds of policies that you choose. And in fact, I don't want to go so far as to make this as a across the board claim, but there are some cases where we see inequality actually hurt growth. So it's really an, an unfair assumption to assume that anything we do on the government front is going to somehow curb our growth. And in fact, I think we can argue the opposite. The other assumption, I think, is that we're talking only about redistribution. And that's not the case. A lot of tax policy, which you mentioned, for example, actually affects the incentives for behavior that ultimately change growth behavior. So we talked about tax policy, for example. We cut marginal gains taxes incredibly at the top. The result was not the increase in investment that we were promised. What we did see was a huge increase in pre-tax 
income for the richest Americans because there are incentives for what we call rent seeking. Some might call negotiating higher salaries. That's a CEO bargaining with their board to, in fact, get a larger share of the corporate profits that might have otherwise gone to R&D, investment, workforce development are going to the CEO. So the kinds of choices we make in the rules and institutions not only affect post-tax and transfer income, but also what we see the market determine. So you don't necessarily think that it's working, this idea that if you create opportunities for the, 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 the company owners, the business owners, that if you sort of create incentives for them, then the rest will follow, growth will follow, and income inequality sure. will, will be solved. I absolutely believe we need growth of business, entrepreneurship, small businesses in particular are huge job creators. However, I think for the last 35 years, we've been sold on this idea that if we focus all of our growth on the top, the largest corporations, the top income earners, that somehow that's going to trickle down. And the, the evidence is in, and that has not been the case. The average American is not doing well, and in fact, the promised growth has failed to materialize. It has grown, it has grown in employment instead of in wages, although it has grown in, in wages if you count uh, health care benefits, pension benefits, and things like that, non-taxable non income. If you look more carefully at the IMF study, by the way, it says that uh, uh, income redistribution doesn't matter in the below the 75th percentile in, it, in the sample of the study. Guess which country is at the 75th percentile? The United States and all the European countries are above the 75th percentile. So it's basically saying that if you redistribute more income than the United States, it will slow growth. And lastly, when you look at are the CEOs taking away money from the rest of the economy, when you really dig down into the uh, Piketty data, it appears that 60 to 70 percent of the people in the top 1 percent or the 0.1 percent are entrepreneurs, uh, hedge fund managers, people like that who are not going to their board of cronies to negotiate their pay increase, they're going to customers and competing against their competitors and persuading those customers to pay them more money. And that's 60 to 70 percent of the people. Well, the I'm top. absolutely in agreement that CEO payment is not the only problem. So if, if we can agree there, then No, I think the, issue is, the issue is really about whether or not the success at the top is a negotiation between them and the rest of the economy where their success reduces the income of the rest of the economy. I don't believe it is because let's go back to the Taylor Swift example. You're spending the same amount of money on music. There just happens to be more people spending money on music, so she makes more money. But has she taken any money away from you? No, you've given that money to her voluntarily, and you're not spending more money on music. It's just there's more people spending money on music so she's getting richer relative to her listeners. Now I want to go back to Nell for a second because, because we've heard uh, some of your thoughts on, on what should or shouldn't be done. Uh, I mean, what do you think should be done if it's not through tax system or, I mean, what should be done to deal with this problem? Sure. Well, I absolutely think there's a lot of room for redistribution through the tax system. I don't mean to say that that isn't an area we should tackle. But I do think we also need to fundamentally rewrite the rules that shape our economy. And that requires a comprehensive approach. That's a, I mean, that's a huge shift in, in thinking in, in ideology? I don't know that it's a huge shift in thinking. I think it's um, following through on the basic premise that our economy is shaped by legal institutions, regulatory structures, uh, bargaining between worker institutions and uh, corporate institutions, and that we might need to re-examine the current balance of all of those rules and regulations. From both of you, I want a, a yes or no answer. Is the American dream dead? No. It's challenged. Ed Connard, Nell Abernathy, thank you very much.